right, friends. So um, for those of you who don't know Two Scientists already, we are a podcast. And thanks to uh, the pandemic, we are also now video podcast. You can see us uh, live and in person. Um, and we are here today for the second part of our two-parter, which we're calling Math the Vote. And uh, last week we heard from Thomas Wayhill, who was talking about some really cool stuff using geometry and gerrymandering. And today our guest is Alexandria Volkening, who's going to talk to us about how to predict elections through polls. And another mathematician. I suppose it should be too shocking, right? <laughs> Alexandria. No, oh, of course. Um, so can you tell us what it was that got you into math in the first place? What inspired you to take that on as your, your academic career? That's a, a good question. I'd say I entered college very convinced that I wasn't going to do math or physics uh, because I thought that I hadn't, I hadn't heard of applied math before. Uh, and I had a really good teacher, uh, John Zweck at UMBC, who said that mathematicians and medical doctors need each other. Uh, and that you could make an impact on these applied problems. And so that was the first time, I think sophomore year that I had heard of applied mathematics. And so that's what got me, I'd say, interested in applied math. And it was started out in biological applications and more social science applications now. Very cool. So where was it that you went to study to do these things? I went to, for undergrad, I did my undergraduate at University of Maryland, Baltimore County, uh, which is right outside of Baltimore in Maryland. And then for graduate school, I went to Brown University in Applied Mathematics. And I graduated in 2017, spent two years at the Mathematical Biosciences Institute at Ohio State, and now I'm at Northwestern. And so were you studying the same kind of things in each place, or has your work kind of evolved over the years? Hmm. I think, so. It, in, in graduate school, my main focus was on fish patterns. So you can think of like salmon or clownfish like Finding Nemo have these patterns on their skin and the patterns form uh, from pigment cells. And so humans also have one type of pigment cell on their skin. Uh, but it, it's, it's kind of similar to how you can think of birds uh, flocking together and interacting with each other, the cells and, and the skin interact together and they form these patterns. So my work initially in graduate school was on uh, understanding how do the pigment cells interact to form the patterns on fish. But I think one of the benefits of modeling is that you can apply it to other problems too. So I do things like, like election forecasting, I do things uh, with social movements on Twitter and intracellular transport. So it's kind of broadened in time. Absolutely, and actually, this is this is what intrigued me about your work. We'll talk a bit more about the the research specifically later. Mm -hmm. But what is it about your work that allows you to apply this idea to so many things that, to maybe the outside observer, they look very disparate? That's a hmm. so. I think that's also why I got into math. So when when I was in undergrad, I, I felt kind of like maybe I would go to med school, maybe I'd go to law school, maybe I'd go to grad school, and so you kind of keep your doors open as much as possible and math has allowed me to be like very broad. Uh, and, and, and so I think mathematical modeling, so just looking at a problem and slowly learning more about it and then just building up a model that can describe that in a mathematical language, that kind of tool of building a model can be applied to lots of different problems. Uh, so one, just, just modeling, I'd say, yeah. Cool. Um, another thing I noticed on your your website, because we, we scattered you out and we had a look at your CV, you do a lot of outreach work rather than, I mean, a lot of people are very dedicated to their academic careers and there are probably still a lot of scientists, mathematicians, folks who don't talk too much to people who are not other specialists in the field. And um, so you've talked to everybody from like kids in school to seniors to uh, teaching in correctional facilities. What is your drive to do that? I, I, so I, it's something my parents involved me in always as a child. Uh, we did, we always did volunteerism and, and outreach. And I think in college, it transitioned from, 
I, I mean, I used to teach, like I, did, I taught fitness in senior citizen centers and would paint old folks nails in college. And at some point you just realize that maybe you should use kind of the mathematical skills you, you have to, to do outreach as well. And cause that's something that you can bring. Uh, so that part of it is just, I, I enjoy outreach and this is, is something I can bring to it. Um, I think it's, for me, it's important as a woman in math to also just be visible in the field and sort of to, to use that to go into a classroom and to have a student, because usually when I go into to classrooms, students will call me Miss so-and-so and to like correct it and be like, oh, actually, you know, I went to school for a long time. And, and what that means is it's, it's a different title. Um, so I think there's some power in using that platform. Uh, so I, I really enjoy it. It's good. I mean, it's like this. So why do you do the the, the two science the two scientists podcast part, part bear? Well, it's essentially to humanize the people behind the work, and also, as you said, to demonstrate that we come from different backgrounds and we don't necessarily look like. I think there is still the stereotypical example of scientist in the white lab coat, and clearly that's not you. I mean, me when I bother to wear a lab coat, I, I guess kind of. Um, but probably Asian woman is not top of the list for people. So yeah, it's it's for people to have real life examples. I think I think there's also I mean it's it's, it's a challenge in and of itself to actually find a way to explain like something that you're working on to any audience. So when I go into I do I like to try to find ways of explaining my research on specifically on fish patterns to to children to so like kindergartners and like you have to you have to think about the words you're using and then put them in a way that makes sense. Uh, and so that's just, I think, an interesting challenge in and of itself. I have to say that the advantage of working on something like clownfish is, is probably something that catches kids' imaginations quite quickly. Right, yeah, I, I, think, I think, yes. I think that when you're working with, with when you have a, you know, a, a room of like 20 or 30 kindergartners and they're all screaming, and so some, some of them are right? just, you're just trying to re reach one child, but uh, in, in that kind of scenario, some of them will get, you know, some of them will just hear math and fish and what in the world, like just connecting those components and showing them applied math earlier. Some of them will only get fish. And we do talk about Nemo when I go into classes and some of them will see this, you know, a woman in STEM and for some reason she, you know, she was able to come in and speak right so they i think they get different things out of it but the 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 fish stuff does help i agree and so then um what were you doing i mean do you apply the same kinds of ideas when you're talking to seniors in terms of catching their attention um hmm. or how do you adapt this the senior citizens are newer for me so i've done two talks with senior citizens on one on fish patterns, one on elections. And for that, it's through an existing program called SPOT at Northwestern. Uh, and they, they stress kind of bringing something into the national news. So to highlight how this is related to news coverage that's going on right now. So I, there, I mean, there, that's certainly a difference. I don't necessarily bring in the, the news when I'm talking to the kids, it's more, hands-on and, and even when you're talking I think when you're talking to kindergartners versus fifth graders you also have to change uh, the presentation style or you lose the fifth graders for sure um I'm wondering when you're talking about polling and elections though do you get lots of questions from folks Depend, depends on the audience <laughs> <laughs> probably depends also on on how well I explain it but going back to the, the subject of um, women in STEM, I also noticed that you're registered as part, one of the, the kind of the list for 500 women scientists. So um, we haven't discussed this on the podcast before, but can you explain who they are and why it was that you were drawn to sign up for them? Sure. So my understanding, and I'd say I'm, I'm not uh, an expert on 500 women, women in science, but I think that the, the idea is that it's uh, a place where if people want someone to talk to in science and they're looking for an expert to just say that here is this group of women that you can draw from uh, for their perspectives and, and ideas. Uh, so it's about, I think sometimes when you're doing things like uh, 
inviting people to give seminars or asking for people's opinions on, on things. So when you're talking to experts, it's occasionally easiest for all of us. The first people we may think of may not be the, the folks who are you know, underrepresented in that, in that group. So just bringing them in and making it easy for people to find experts and making it visible. Have you been called on yet as an expert? I, I don't think so. There were, I don't think so. I don't think you would know uh, if it came through I that, see. right? Okay. So that's a good question. So David says, uh, is it easier to be a woman in maths when the maths are applied versus more, I guess, abstract stuff? Hmm. I think it's probably very, very much based on each individual person's experience. Uh, it is true that there are, at least in the US, I think there's significantly more women in say mathematical biology than in other fields of math. So when I go to conferences and like partial differential equations, it's the difference I think between looking around and being maybe, you know, one, like one of 20% in a room versus being the only one in a room, depending on, you know, what, what conference and what field it is. Uh, but there are also, I think, mathematical biology workshops where you can be the only woman in a room, depending on the subfield of it, right? So uh, I don't know if the word is easier or, or not, but it's just, there, there may be more in some fields, which is good. Yes, <laughs> more in all the fields would be better, but you know. Right, right. And it is what it is. You mentioned that you, you sometimes wear a lab coat. So you do both uh, math, and math and biology? I do no math whatsoever. Okay. I do as little math as possible. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, uh, essentially, I've, I now have probably a deeper understanding of uh, applied math just from hanging out with David and um, his colleagues at Integrated Mathematical Oncology. In fact, I probably know more people in um, math modeling in the US than I do neuroscientists at this stage. Okay. But um, yeah. But your work is on neuroscience, which is, is yes. okay. That, I feel like that's a field that has brought in a lot of mathematical models in, in, into it as well. Absolutely. I mean, in the last, I have to say, since I moved to the US, um, I didn't know this was a thing at all, uh, applying the kind of models that people are talking about. And then I realized as we moved on, as my colleagues were asking people to, for example, um, model the electricity within a neuron to see if, the shape of that represents the kind of ions that move in and out during uh, an action potential. So uh, when a nerve cell fires, um, I think that's the first time I started to see work that kind of David and his colleagues do applied to neuroscience. And it's, I'm kind of curious as to how your work you, works on neurons specifically because the neurons that I work on are among the longest that we have in the body. And I know that the kind of things that you model um, look at transportation within those nerves. Mm -hmm. So how do your models uh -huh. map that out? So first of all, how long is the, what are the long, what does long mean? Ooh, so in humans, the, the sensory nerves can be as long as, I guess, if you're a really tall human, they could be a meter. Oh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> so, so what, what I do that has this kind of, is in this vein of neuroscience. So one of the things is actually, uh, so intracellular transport is one, but I also do um, uh, looking at like social movements on Twitter and we actually model it like an integrate and fire neuron model. So the idea of some excitement building up in a person related to some um, feature in the news. And then once that excitement reaches some threshold, you fire off a tweet and then you <gasps> go, go back. That's so, so cool. Yeah, it's, it's kind, of, <laughs> kind of fun. Uh, but for the intracellular transport stuff, it's it, that's kind of a new application for me. It's this idea, right? That for, for those who don't know, um, neurons have uh, kind of, you can think of them as having roadways inside them. And so you have to, the neuron needs to transport things from one side of the cell to the other side of the cell. And with these meter long neurons, uh, which I don't think are the ones <laughs> that I look at, uh, you know, you have to, you have to transport. And so there are these proteins that you can think of like cars as, as really like hooking onto the roads and transporting a, uh, a cargo across the neuron. So we just model uh, 
how does that transportation happen? What would happen if the transportation broke down? Would you get a traffic jam inside your neuron? That wouldn't be good. Things like this. So it's um, what information do you get from, I assume you work with biologists in order to make these models or do you extract information from their papers or how does it work? Most of my work focuses on, uh, initially I think that first you have to just put forward a model that is probably simple, sim too, sim too simple is the reality. Uh, so it's simple, it kind of gets you into the field and then you start to look around and look at the literature and get a better sense of things. So uh, for the intracellular transport work in, in neurons, I'm not working with an experimentalist right now. I do work with experimentalists for my, my zebrafish work and that's slowly built up uh, over years. I think that okay. anytime you can talk to, anytime you can talk, anytime you find a biologist who's willing to talk to you, it's, uh, it's invaluable because they can speed everything up and help you figure out what the interesting questions are. Very cool. And so does this also extend to the, the work that you're doing now in terms of modeling social sciences? Because this is, I guess, this is where the, the polling work comes in, right? So with the the election forecasting work, we are, we are, this is our, we're kind of stepping into the field. Uh, and so right now we don't have social science collaborators. My experience, I think it's, and it might just be because I come from a math biology background, but I think it's sometimes easier to cross the disciplinary divide between math and biology. Uh, so I'm excited to cross this disciplinary divide between math and social science and, and getting some social scientist collaborators in the, in the future, but not yet. That would be extremely cool, though. But what inspired this project then? The, the project that we're working on on election forecasting was, in, so it started with a, a few different folks, Daniel Linder, who is at Augusta University, Mason Porter at UCLA, and, and Greg Rimpala, uh, who's at Ohio State, and it came out of the 2016 elections, uh, where I think we all remember that there was this huge like all of the forecasters were, were giving Clinton a, a big chance of winning, right? And we can think about what does big chance actually mean uh, is a, a separate question, I think. Uh, but uh, we, we realized you have all these different forecasters. Some people were giving her a 99% chance of winning. Others were giving her a 70% chance of winning. And we just didn't understand it. We didn't understand what those what, where those numbers were coming from. Uh, and we wanted to bring a mathematical modeling perspective to it. And really, I think the motivation was partly just to understand the process better ourselves. Uh, that, 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 that was kind of the first thing. So one of the most famous examples, I think if you're really nerdy about these models and politics in general is obviously 538. Um, so for anybody who doesn't already follow them, they obviously have extensive models and um, they, as I understand it, they look at polling data from various different sources. And uh, so we've listened to the, the podcast where they talk model talk and they, they essentially try and describe how they kind of tweak, um, I guess, their algorithm so that it spits a particular thing out. So how does what you do relate to what they do? Can you explain what it is that... Um, do you know what they do? Because I have no idea. Like they talk about the model, but you know, to me it means very little. So what what 538 does, my, my understanding is so first, the one thing that so they are extremely good at aggregating polling data and they they create these publicly available Excel documents that are what our model is uh, powered on of just the polling data from all different so polling houses. So this is what a polling organization is a, or a polling house is the group that collects polls and uh, what 538 does, and I think what they're particularly well known for, is that they don't treat all the polls equally. They assign different polling organizations or different polling houses a grade. So you can be like an A-plus polling house or a, a C-minus polling house, right? And uh, they, based on that, they will weight certain polls more or less importantly in, in their work. Uh, so that's one thing that they do. Another thing they do is account for the idea of um, elections being correlated in different states. So the, the, the idea is that if you're off and you misidentify who's going to win in Wisconsin, then chances are you're also going to misidentify 
who's going to win in Minnesota. So you're kind of going to hit missing a whole bunch of states at once. This can be because of something like misidentifying what a likely voter is when you mm -hmm. construct the poll. Uh, so, so they do this, but the, their approaches are based on statistical modeling. So it's taking in all these polls, weighting them in different ways. What we're using is a dynamic mathematical model uh, that again uses the polling data, but is kind of projecting forward uh, what's going to happen using differential equations. Okay, so literally, what is it that you take from the data that's out there? How does it get plugged into your model? And then what is it that it spits out at the end? Good, that's a good question. So it, what we, we take in is, so there, there's two types of data that are they're commonly used in, in election forecasts. One is polling data, and the other is fundamental data, which is meant to be how we're fundamentally making our decisions. That's things like the economy or uh, you know what party we identify with, or if we think that the candidates are good speakers or various other things. So we, our model is fully based on polling data. We don't use the, the fundamental data. And, and what we do is basically take, take the polling data and then we average it by month. So you just get you know, one single polling data point average per month. And we actually use models that are also used to, to study uh, infectious diseases like, like the flu. Uh, they're called, so you may have seen some of these in the news, things like susceptible, infected, susceptible models. These are models that at their core are just ways of taking people and grouping them into compartments. Uh, so you could be someone who is in the susceptible compartment to a biological disease or someone who is in the infected compartment for a disease, right? And then you prescribe rules for how do you change compartments. So you might expect if you're a susceptible person, you interact with an infected person, you can change to infected. So that, that is actually, that is the type of model that we use is if you are a Democratic or a Republican voter, you can interact with an undecided voter and make them change what group they belong to. So that, that's the kind of structure of our model. We combine it with polling data to understand what are the influence between the voters. Very cool. So I guess you've um, kind of answered David's question, which is, um, you use compartmental models. What are they? Right, and it, and it's at its very core, a compartmental model is grouping people into compartments or or groups, and prescribing rates for how do you change what group you belong to. And it's it's been applied for you know it's applied for biological diseases. It's also applied for social contagions, things like how quickly you will adapt to new technology, uh, and and now to election forecasting. I think one of the, oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, please. Oh, so the other thing you asked was just what comes out of the models. And I think that there's like all different. So if you go to 538's website, you'll see that there are all different ways that they're visualizing what comes out of their models, right? There are things like electoral vote distributions. There are things where we just say, what are the margin of victory is in a, in a state? Uh, so that would mean like, how much is the Republican or the Democratic candidate winning by? Uh, there's also just, we think with this chance, so and so is going to win the election, right? So all these different things uh, can come come out of a model, and that's they come out of our our models as well. One thing that we are we haven't focused on as much is what the percent of undecided voters is in each state, and I think that's an interesting thing to think about too. Not just the margin, but who hasn't decided yet. Yeah, um, particularly important, <laughs> especially in Florida. <laughs> yes, yes not indeed. In, not in Illinois. <laughs> yes, this is true. Um, so following up on that, David says one can make many decisions taking the polling data and applying mathematical, the mathematical approach that you use. What guides your decision process when making those decisions? <laughs> A decision process. Uh, so, so I'd say we, across our model, uh, we chose to be as simple as possible wherever we could. So the reality is that when I say we use this, this model that is also used to study biological diseases to forecast elections, that in and of, in of, it, in and of itself is a simplification, right? Because those are not, those are very different things. And, and the way that, you know, we don't just interact with uh, a Republican voter and, and change our opinions. It's, it's, you know, a whole, whole bunch of things. There's news coverage and, uh, you know, 
your maybe peer pressure and, and all sorts of things can can interact together. So it's very complex, complex what's actually going on. And for the data, we also chose as simple a way as possible of handling the polling data. Uh, so so we we own, like I said, we only weight it by we don't weight it at all. We we just average it by month. We don't weight more recent polls as more strongly. You might expect that re more recent polls might be better polls than polls from a year ago. We don't account for the fact that some polls are partisan polls. Uh, some polls are framed in terms of likely voters or, or some polls are framed in terms of registered voters. So the, the difference there is actually most of the polling data that you see that's publicly available is not actually the raw polling data. It's data that's been weighted and adjusted. And when a pollster calls you and asks who you're going to vote for, they make a decision about whether or not you are a likely voter. Right. And so whether they're going to include you in their data set. So we don't necessarily usually it's proprietary what they define as a likely voter. So so those are all adjustments that you can make to the polling data, but we just read it all the same. We assume it's all equally good, uh, which is a simplification because I'm sure it's not all equally good. And, and and in terms of right, so it was just it was always the simplest approach possible was was how we started this. Can you just clarify what you mean by the term waiting? Waiting. So waiting means, uh, so for instance, if you have uh, two two polls, uh, so you have a poll from from you, Farm Beer, and a, a poll from me. Uh, if we know that in the past, you know, ten elections, your poll has been better at forecasting the election than mine, then we might say, well, it's not. We're not just going to average the two of our polls. We're actually going to say yours is better. We should trust yours more. So maybe we multiply yours by 0.7 and we multiply mine by 0.3. So we just kind of, we say yours is, yours is better, we should, we should trust it more. Uh, so that, that would be weighting it in different ways. And, and that's what, what 538 does. I think that those are really important things to do and that's what we want to do, something we want to consider in the future to see, does that improve the forecast uh, in our yeah. model? But, but for now, it's just simplest choice. That's, it's kind of a basic modeling uh, philosophy that you go with the simplest thing and you see how that works and then you build complexity from there. <laughs> so David says, if palm bear polls are better, why not use those straight away? <laughs> well, okay, so, the, so okay. Uh, I think this is a thing now. Alex Alexandria polls and palm bear polls are a thing. <laughs> They're only slightly better. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that, that's that's also a, a good question. I, I think part of it is just that you want also to have a, the more polling data that you're using in some sense, you're getting more samples of people. So it is a question of whether or not you actually want to throw out all the polls. And it's not always clear that, you know, it's a 70-30 divide here. I think that the reality is when you're dealing with elections, this is something we've realized, it's hard to even judge forecasts because it's kind of, I mean, there's not a ton of elections that happen in the US. It's a pretty infrequent thing. So, you know, if it only rained every, you know, two or every four years, it's just harder to judge a <laughs> forecaster's accuracy, right, in terms of the weather. If, 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 and so I think that's part of it, that it's it, when it's hard to figure out which, which polls are, are better. Um, and then the reality is some states are polled a ton. So a state like Florida is going to be polled a ton. Some states are polled very infrequently. Uh, some polls, some states aren't polled at all. And so, if you don't use the polling data that's available for a state because it's not not necessarily the best data, then you have no data, right? So, do you get very different responses from people in different states with regards to the polling information? Do you know? Well. Uh, so the polling data we use is, is aggregated by 538 and so it's 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 this, this publicly available data i think you mean in terms of response rate in terms of how they like the vote yeah market? who participates and um because ah. i guess you, you also have to have to adjust for things like demographics um if mm. a given state is a lot older i think this is this is one of the problems that people are incurring now right people don't answer the phone anymore i certainly don't answer the phone anymore I let Google filter people for me before I have to to uh, contact another human. Um, 
<laughs> I guess this this is not necessarily your work, or is this something that you consider when you're you're creating your models? I think that that is a really important research question and identifying what's going on with like behind the scenes. So this this is this is not my work right now because we just take the publicly available polling data as is. But behind that step, so before those Excel documents become become a thing, it is true that there's all these issues of what is your sample size, what is what is the mechanism that they're using to create that sample. So uh, you know, some polls are done online, some polls are done by cell phone, some are done by landline right there. I read about a poll that was done over a video gaming console. So that's just choosing very different parts of the population, right? And so all of those things are things I think the polling houses will take into account when they weight their polling data before we, behind the scenes, before we actually see what comes out. Yeah. Um, so David was saying, have you tried different versions of your model other than the one that you have put on the website? So are you, um, I guess he's talking about GitHub is where you've been sharing all your information? Mm -hmm. GitLab. Mm -hmm. GitLab. We, we have, uh, we have only done this disease transmission model so far. We've started to look at if you were to only use, so if you were to only use likely voter polls. So what would happen if you, you cut out some of the some of the polls because you think the registered voter polls are maybe worse. Does that improve the forecast? And what we're seeing is that for the subset of elections that we've done this analysis for, that it improves it in some states and in other states not. So it's hard to draw conclusions, and we want to see if you look across, you know, the the four years that we had four elections that we have polling data for, uh, does it does it improve it consistently? in Minnesota, for example, if you use likely voter polls rather than registered voter polls, and does it consistently not improve it in Ohio? We want to tease that out, but at this point, it's unclear. I think there's a lot of questions left, and that's part of the reason we put the work on GitLab is because we wanted to encourage other people to get involved too, because we're not election forecasting experts, so it, it's really it's a, a way of putting it. By using the disease transmission models, we're putting it in kind of a multidisciplinary framework that we hope will be familiar with other people as well. Yeah, this is, I think this is the, the interesting thing about your work is that it's so different from what up until recently biologists were doing, which was, you know, they, they'd hoard all of their stuff and then they'd publish it 18 months later, at which point, you know, the field's probably already moved on to some degree, mm -hmm. whereas it feels like um, certainly within the modeling world, the, the data and the information is much more transparent, right? I think it's also, I, I guess it's very different too, because my understanding is when you're a biologist, you're putting much more effort into these experiments that can take so much longer. And, and I mean, there's what stresses me out about a biologist job is that they're dealing with equipment that is so expensive, I couldn't imagine. <laughs> I, this is, I, I'm a person who packs two shirts in, in my conference bag anytime I go for when I inevitably pour coffee on my shirt. So <laughs> my, my, so my, my coffee cup just never goes on the same desk as my computer because I am incapable of that. So I think, I, I, I imagine that's part of the reason that mathematicians can have a little more transparency is that they that their things aren't taking the same amount of time in the same way as biological experiments. I, I don't know if you have thoughts on that. I, I think my feel was more that people are so worried that they're going to get scooped that they right. were not prepared to put things out there, except right. COVID seems to have changed that. Okay. Um, for better or worse, I guess. I mean, there's there's so much information coming out now that it's it's to some degree it's worrying to see what people are just prepared to put out there I without um, the kind of the, the the number of replicates to probably make these fair assumptions. Um, it I think I think even even for me, so we put our first forecasts up in in 2018, right before the midterms, just on archive, which is a preprint server. And I found it extremely stressful because usually when you're working in biological problems as a mathematician, I think it's like you put out this paper and you know you wait a couple of years for them, like for the experimentalist to tell you why you're wrong. And so it, it's not like <laughs> it's not and and so you it's um there's there's a delay and and then you can build on it. And and I think uh for the election stuff it was terrifying to be immediately 
right, right or wrong. And I can imagine with the COVID stuff that that is just, I mean, it's an entirely different level of importance that's, that's going on as this work is coming out. Quite. I mean, I know colleagues in the field who are distraught at their own colleagues now, people who are working in immunology and virology saying, just stop, please. Um, but going back to the polling, so I think this was with regards to, um, I can't remember what I was talking about at the time, but whatever you said, apparently you raised a very good point. <laughs> so David says, hypothetically now, it's November 4th or 5th or 6th or whenever the final results are in. Um, how will you know if you got it right? Or does it take a few elections to have enough data to prove or disprove your method? I guess that was Luke's concern. That's a, that's a great question. So what I like to say is, so 538 last, last election, so 2016, gave Clinton right. It was about a 70% chance mm -hmm. and, and Trump uh, about a 30% chance. And so people will say they got it wrong. And I think the reality is that is like, if we all were to take a quarter and flip it twice, if we flip it twice and we got two heads, we wouldn't be in utter shock. I mean, if we flipped it a hundred times and we got a hundred heads, then when we would be in shock. But but really that so there's a 25% chance of flipping a quarter twice and, and getting two heads. And and so in that sense, the reality is a 30% chance for Trump is was high in 2016. So I think part of the issue is that when we all look at these forecasts. And I, I do it. I look at it and I just look at the color of the states. And I want to know, is this red or is it blue? And you kind of, you, you kind of, you, you go through it and you count them up and you're like, okay. And, and the reality is, it's, what you should be looking at is the, the confidence interval. So what is the range of the forecasts? Uh, so in, in, in many of our forecasts, we have, uh, we have a, a democratic uh, win projected. And so the, the bars are all blue. Uh, but the reality is, if you look at the percent of undecided voters that are in those states, it's actually higher than the margin of uh, victory. So it's entirely possible that that uh, could be upset. So I think what you need to do is look at a forecast, it, just like you said, David, you need to look at it across many different election years. And it's, it's challenging because there's only so many election years that have data available uh, and, and polling data available. But what you'd want is to be able to put forward, you know, if you put forward four forecasts, you'd hope that, you know, if you're forecasting that there's a 25% chance of a certain candidate winning, you'd expect to get it right about three out of four of those times. So I really love your coin toss analogy because that is, I think the, the best demonstration, you know, people, as you say, they, they like to look at the maps and they like to see, okay, is this going to go blue or is this going to go red? Whereas by saying that, it's like, yeah, of course, like if, if you flip, the coin three times it's likely to happen um and i think that a lot of people's perceptions of whether these things work well or not is based on um you know not being able to understand what the statistics mean right so you give percentages to people and it it doesn't easily equate especially when things are emotive you know you tell somebody that they have an x percent percentage chance of being afflicted by a particular disease like how do you take the emotion out of that and just deal with the numbers that you're given that's, that's yeah that's a good point because the, the numbers also mean i think very different things right because if it's a 20 percent chance of raining tomorrow versus like a 20 percent chance of getting in a car accident tomorrow like it, it all would like it is exactly what you're saying the way we interpret these things is quite different so um he also said what results could come in in the election that would make you say, yes, we got this one wrong? <laughs> Just it's an interesting way of phrasing it, David. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't know if anything would make me go, yes, we got this one wrong. <laughs> Quite like that. Um, let's see, what would, I think, I think what so there are different ways of judging forecast accuracy. One is just looking at the colors of, of the states and just saying, did you identify the right winner in, in a state? I would say that is the easiest way to judge forecast accuracy, but it's probably the least meaningful. Uh, I think what is 
often more meaningful is looking at the vote margin. So if you if you are, for instance, projecting that Trump will win a state by just two percentage points and he he ends up losing by you know, 0 0.5 percentage points, then that's actually a pretty, you were pretty close at your forecast. All right. So I think that 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 is so if you're looking at those differences in the in the vote, that if our differences are small, that would mean we have a, a pretty good forecast this year. If the differences are quite large, even if it's if even if our forecast for a given state is that Trump will win by you know 20 percentage points, if he ends up winning by 50 percentage points, then that was perhaps a bad forecast because we really missed there was a huge error in the in the vote margin there, even though we identify the correct winner. So I think looking at vote margin is important and and more generally just using this as so right now what we have polling data for is 2004 through 2016 so we'll pop 2020 in there as well and see what was our accuracy across those years we, we want to be able to say when we're 75 percent confident that we in fact get 75 percent of those races correct that would be good so on the subject of um kind of outcomes so you've been talking about how you do these things um what's the why behind doing this so we're, we're kind of curious i mean we were talking to um thomas last week because he's part of a group who is studying gerrymandering in order to be able to work with um local groups to be able to help um what's the phrase i'm looking for No, the word is not gerrymandering. I already mentioned gerrymandering. Redistricting. To work with, to, yes, to work with local groups to help um, establish fairer redistricting. Mm -hmm. um, so on that note, David says, we know you've given a lot of presentations recently on the basis of this work. Have you been contacted by non-academics looking to um, try and get some understanding or maybe gain an advantage through these predictions? I did get to meet a former senator that came to uh, a conference talk once, which was to like, totally fun and um, unexpected. But uh, so not 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 at this point. I think the reality is this model is simplified. It's it's going to come out in a in a couple of days um, in in published form. Uh, I think really our motivation is more mathematical with this problem, where what we want to do is kind of invite a larger audience to engage with election forecasting. And, and and just because we like I think it is part of it is just we didn't understand the process particularly well when we started and we wanted to just bring a, a new perspective to it. So I think hopefully what it'll do is raise questions within the mathematical community and maybe other uh, communities as well. So I'd say hopefully then the next research that comes out of this will will have more of a real world impact in that way. Cool. Um so you you're quite um happy to share various bits of the, the information that's coming out on your Twitter account. Um, have you been contacted or uh, you know, has anyone spoken to you on Twitter about your results and made any comments as to what they think? Um, particularly people who are, you know, they're not experts in the field and they don't maybe understand mm -hmm. how the models work. Most of the audience so far has been an academic audience. I, I gave a one of the conference talks I, I gave a, last year was it was really cool because I, so I did a poster on elections and a group of folks came by and you kind of ask what their background is to get a sense of how to pitch the presentation. And it turned out that they were actually family members who were with a mathematician at the conference. And so this was like the poster that was accessible. And uh, that was really cool to, to kind of cross the, that. And so it wasn't an academic community. Uh, but it, it, I'd say most of the case on in Twitter, it is predominantly academic so far okay. and mathematicians based. So if they held any uh, abuse your way, say, oh, this is utter rubbish. What are you talking about? Um, for the most part, no. I think that it, so we have gotten feedback that the, the model is. So one thing that we do uh, that is a simplification because when you're building models, you start with the, the the simplified models. Is when we account for interactions between people. So this idea that you know a Democrat or Republican uh, individual would 
you know, talk to you and, you know, in some sense, for lack of a better word, transmit an opinion. Of course, this is just as it relates to biological diseases and it's it's not the same thing. And simplified, the reality is that it's it's much more complex than social interactions. It would depend on the network of interactions around you and you wouldn't be, we're not equally likely to interact with everyone in the community. We, we most likely based on just, it's just the same on Twitter or on Facebook, right? We have certain, or even in news media, there are certain groups that we kind of align with and that we in, are more likely to be connected to than other groups. So I think we have gotten feedback that one thing that the model could do better is account for the fact that everyone is not equally likely to interact with anyone else, but there are much more complex interactions going on. So that will be something for, for future work. Excellent. Nice to get constructive feedback. Certainly. I think it's questions and feedback are useful because it makes you better. It makes you aware of new things. I think for, for me, the biologists who have refereed papers of mine and really been you know, constructive has, has been the, the absolute best thing to get the feedback from experts. So I, I was going to say, let's leave this on a positive note, but I was wondering, uh, do you have any like coping mechanisms to deal with the influx of election-based news? <laughs> hmm. Do you, do you have any? Or just do switching do things off. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let me think. Um, I, I, well, Netflix is good. Um, coffee and tea is good. <laughs> I think. How, how, how about you, Farm Beer? What is your? Uh, actually, I currently I'm drinking something which is a pineapple upside down sherbet wheat. It's ridiculously all the things, um, and it's very sweet. I was gonna say there needs to uh, come more adjectives now. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Um, yes, a lot of drinking and watching political TV shows that make us mm. wish politics was better. <laughs> or a walk around the, the lakes. There's a, it's nearby Northwestern, which is nice. That, that does sound lovely. I, I have to say, I really miss fall from other places at autumn, as I like to call it. Mm. Um, so the very last thing we would like to ask you before um, we let you depart is your dirt story. You have a story for us about um, potentially something that's happened during your career that was um, not as you expected. You, you called it a, a dirt story? Is that a dirt story, yes. A, go a good dirt story. Something that's happened as a undergraduate student. So a way long time ago before I, I, I knew better as a senior, I once gave a research presentation in a cheerleading uniform. Because <laughs> no one told me you weren't supposed to do that. <laughs> um, and I had, to, I had to go to a cheerleading game afterward and I didn't want to waste time changing my outfit. That's fabulous. I, was, I, I, I think that, but... more people should do that. Maybe. This is, this is I suspect time. I would pay more attention to presentations if people actually if you can cheer the whole thing. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I have a backup. I think this would be much more interesting. Absolutely. Yeah, but more yes. recently it's it's just the the the, the coffee not being on my computer. And say. <laughs> Long may it stay that way. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time, Alexander. We really appreciate it. And um, we look forward, at least David will look forward to seeing your paper when it comes out and maybe he'll translate it for me. Thank you both for the opportunity. Thanks, thanks so much, Farm Beer. Cool. Thank you. And Jill also says thank you. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye.